tell you what. We just do this show like, just roll it out, man. I, I love doing this podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Chad Brady Show. We're hanging out here in Studio 22. Look at this. Look at the logo on this thing right here. This is fantastic, mostly because it's me. We got Silent Herbert back there. We got Director Mark Tate sitting behind the desk making all the magic happen. Over in the peanut gallery, we got Bougie Sean, and we got Party Foul Steve, and they're hanging out. They're hey. giving a little color commentary no offense but wow. what that's messed color. up dude called that's that's color yeah the only the only black color. dude i know with white privilege i tell you bougie color. that's why we call him bougie people say why do you call him bougie that's racist and i'm like what what how is bougie it means he's fancy i even he's... know the understanding of that word <laughs> you know that's that could be an east texas term i'm sitting here with my brother from another mother Mr. Heath Oaks, the most Thanks successful man I know. Uh, now you're lying. No. Yeah, I paid you very well to lie like I that. I sit back and I look at your life and I go, I just want to be <laughs> Heath Oaks in so many ways. And I'm going to explain to everybody why. All right. Why I'm I feel curious that way. to know this. So, Heath, Heath Oaks, my brother, you and I did your podcast, which you now do with your wife, Jenny Ann Chanda. We did Second Shot, yep. which was your brainchild, your dream, your vision, and it really was – it was a great podcast. We did that for, what, a year? Yeah, I think we got in like 37, 38 episodes or so before you really took off and you were never able to be around anymore. Yeah, I was constantly on the road yeah. doing all that stuff. And Which I'm it, amazed we were able to get 37 – between both of our schedules, I was that was shocking. Well, it was a lot because you're a busy dude, yeah. and I was having to travel all the way from where I was living down yep. south of Fort Worth, Texas, to come over to this, you know, where were we? North Dallas yep. in the studios. Yep. And you're still over there with Real News PR. Yep. yep. And uh, what what's the name of the, the RN? RNCN, I think, is RNCN. the studios. Yeah, yeah. And so second shot, second shot, and I love it. Explain to everybody – because you're still doing it, and it's still yep. a great podcast. My wife I love, and I now. You guys have grown it to yep. this, and it's, I love it. I love everything you've done, the new studios and everything. Explain to people your concept of where the name Second Shot and what it's all about. Well, you're the one who said I came up with the name, or, or did you come up with the name, and I had the idea. I think you, you came, came up, up with, the, with the idea, and I came up with the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, basically it was a way of saying, you know, I always saw news headlines or any kind of headline, and it always made me think of a way to make that a positive turn, right? So. Um, our, our goal was to make a podcast that could be positive, entertaining, inspirational, motivational, you know, um, but not like that. You know, a lot of that motivation stuff is somebody like screaming at you, telling you you suck at life and you need to be better, you know. <laughs> and I was like, there's a lot of that. So why not my mom? Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I, I wanted more entertaining, more like fun, uplifting, but with some uh, tactical stuff. So what we do is it's a 30 minute deal and we'll take a news headline and we'll, we'll take a wave how to make a second shot on that to to kind of turn that to your life and how to help you with yeah. and it's it, it's it's my wife and i are the ones that do it now and so it's um you know we, we get on business stuff personal stuff parenting marriage i mean all kinds of stuff uh what we'll turn it to so it's a little bit different of a take than most uh kind of podcasts i like it because it's it's a it's a such a unique idea of taking the headlines taking a second look at it how could you interpret this and apply it to anyone's life and we've encountered when we were doing it, and I listened so, to the second shot, I listen to it every week. I, I, there have been some really strange headlines out there, and some of them stand out. Like, do you remember? Like, there's so many stories. This is what got me into Mark. Like, we would we would get these headlines, and Heath would come up with these things. I was like, what the hell is wrong with people? Yeah. Like, people are damaged goods. You remember the assistant coach with the uh, Miami Dolphins who was doing oh, blow on yes. his desk there at the facility, at the Miami Dolphins facility? And well, he, he took talking. his picture and sent it to his uh, prostitute. Yeah, he did his video, and he sent it. He was a white dude. Yeah. She was a black girl in, in Vegas, and he was he thought he was being all cool and stuff. Sending her a, a video of him snorting coke. And she totally exposed. Yes. She was like, okay, here we go. Did him dirty. Like that. <laughs> That's love the it. Kind of- <laughs> I love it. It's like that's what you like, get. Like, what happened to that dude? Yeah. What McDonald's is he working at these days? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he found a job somewhere. I'm like, he thought he was such a pimp baller that he was just going to do blow on it on his office desk at the Miami Dolphins and facility. videoed himself doing it. You know, like <laughs> he's like, hey, look what I'm doing, baby. Like, you know, if somebody videoed you doing it and send it out, I'd be like, oh, that sucks for you. 
but like you did it yourself. <laughs> like you, you, like you tied your own. Yes, news. you did it yourself. I don't get it. It <laughs> makes no sense. Did he Jesse Smollett himself? Yes, yeah, he Smollett. He, he Smollett himself. 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 Yeah, he yeah. totally just. You know, my favorite meme right now is the uh, "Cash Me Outside" girl. You know, who's like, she's like, "Cash me outside," and then down below it is Jesse says, "I cash my damn self outside." <laughs> <laughs> I love that. No, but we we. That's the beauty of Second Shot because you on that podcast come up with the. I'm like, where are you getting? Like every now and then, I will say weird news headlines or, or funny current news. NBC does a good job actually of coming up with some really funny stories that are out there that people just hard to believe. But you have always come up with the best stuff. Well, and I'm like, where are you getting this stuff from? It might have been what a podcast ago or something that my wife was on, Jenny and Chando, who who is my wife, and and. You know, if anybody's watched the podcast with my wife and then see me, that's that's how you can know I'm a good salesman <laughs> because I talked to her into being my wife. Like, you yeah. know, that's a good salesman. Yeah. When you get a wife that hot and you look like me, <laughs> you're winning, brother. Okay. If you goes. haven't seen Jenny and Chando, you got to go to last week's podcast episode on Thursday and uh, look at the episode with Jenny and Chando. Yeah, you you married up. We all married up. We all married like a up. champ. We did. So Let's I take it. her. I take her advice. I, I I go to all kinds of sites. Yeah. I I know that I listened to the last podcast and she talked about how best things to do is get different sources. Jenny what you want. is the last true journalist on the planet. Yeah. She, she is. truly is, and she takes a lot of pride in that in yeah. being a and in her personal life she actually is a middle of the road type of yeah person. She really will take from both. Yeah. In a big way. Yeah. In my real life, I'm that way too, but not publicly. I like to. I like to burn it down. <laughs> just set the fire and watch. Just see how many people show up to watch it. One of the funny ones we just did, and it made me think of it a while ago, was we did this headline where um, this, and we, what we don't do is we don't typically ever get into the exact like uh, basis of that headline as much as we will use it for funny context, but then take it. So this dude was trying to build his, his business at his house um, and take it out of renting the office space that he was at. And so um, the the town wouldn't approve all the permits and stuff. So he made a giant statue of a hand flipping the, 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 <laughs> like, cause he lived like on a hill and it was a big middle fling finger with a spotlight on it toward the city. Basically like saying, screw you because he was so mad that they wouldn't approve the permits. Right. Yeah. And that's what he did. And, and he can do it right. They can't change it. It's on his property. And it's literally when you come into that little town, it is what you see. Cause it is on the hill bright spotlight with a middle finger flipping the town off and so that's obviously <laughs> it's a modern day michelangelo is what that is it absolutely it's, it's hilarious and so what we use that for was you know sometimes using the uh you know it's for the principle the fact that they won't get it done right well screw you because you got to hold your emotions in check because for instance he will never get anything ever done in that city again right no. like it won't happen so like who does he hurt the most at the end of the day it's creative and funny, yeah. but like he's never going to be able to get anything done. So was it really worth it? You know? <laughs> like how many times do we do that? Who sits around and says, you know what I'm going to do today? <laughs> hey, babe, wake up. I want to tell you something. I, I got an idea. Um, I'm so pissed off that uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? Write a letter to the editor? No, I got a bigger no. idea than that. I uh, Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get a bunch of plaster of Paris. <laughs> And we're gonna we're gonna get a bucket. We're gonna really start mixing stuff up. I'm gonna build a huge middle finger, I'm gonna, one big old phallic symbol right there, and I'm gonna f you to the city. And it was huge, <laughs> it was huge, with a spotlight on it. So ever it's like it, it, it was like the Hollywood sign over Hollywood. You know when you pull in, that's what they saw in the city, which I think is like. And, and coming from somebody who's had lots of issues pulling permits from cities with yeah. some of the building stuff. Oh, trust me, right? you have, yeah. Um, but. It, yeah, it's on a massive pole, yeah. like overlooking everything. It's great. All middle fingers should be. Oh, it's in Vermont. It explains yeah. it. It's Vermont. It's, it's Vermont. It's Bernie. It's Bernie country. <laughs> it's with Fidel. You know, I love Cuba. I love, everybody needs pudding. Yeah, in a middle finger. A middle finger. <laughs> no, I, that's that's funny to me, man. I. So that's the second shot we took on it. And that's great because it's a great concept. So mm -hmm. let's back up. Let's back up because people are going, who the hell's Heath Oaks? Let me tell you who Heath Oaks is. He's going to tell you. I, I, um, I'm a hustler. You're a hustler. I think you and I connected on, on a couple of levels when we got to know each other. And, and, you know, I say it over and over, you guys are family 
to me because we just became immediate. Yeah, like, we you know, some people fast. are instant. Yeah. yeah, you know, you meet people and it's like every, like everybody in this room instant. You just like I like this person. I want to be. I want to know this person. But I, I I admired you immediately because you're a dude who is who is a self made success story, and it started. First of all, you're a redneck. Yep. You obviously my accent. Slaughter the English language. <laughs> just We've made fun of that it. so many times, and there's been a couple of words you've said here earlier that I think you might have. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm just going to let those go. Um, I make them all up. But but you do them so naturally when you say those words that it's like, yeah, I know what he meant. Okay, so it's a new word. Screw it. It's a new word. I knew yeah. what he meant. Yeah. Like, I don't even call it out anymore. Like I used to do it on second shot. I was like, what? Wait, 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 wait. Let's go back. Waller. Remember Waller. <laughs> Waller. <laughs> yeah, we just want Waller in it. So I want to know, you started, I want you to go back, I want you to tell the story about your uncle. I want you to tell the story about being 19 years old and just give it to me. So I, I grew up- look at this dude. He looks good. So By the way- That's going to throw him off with the redneck he, when they he see this He didn't buy this suit at Ross, okay? Yeah. This, yeah. This, they, this, this, this is, you're looking at a successful man. Yeah. Well, this is, yeah, now I, I should be I should have been making money off of my girl because now as much as you've purchased from her, I don't. Even, I'm embarrassed to know. So so <laughs> Harper and Jones, we'll give them a little shout out. Our girl Brittany Nicklin and yeah. I told Brittany I said I want to get you on the podcast. Yeah, and because, it would be good for her to talk about dressing and stuff. Would it actually would. Be, yeah, I think it so. would because so so Heath for the longest time always had these custom suits and look at him. He's got the Labatan uh, shoes on. And I mean, just fancy. Got the socks. Got the tie. There's nothing on this man's body that was not custom made for him. But he gonna tell you why that's important. And but anyway, I, I'm a sport coat guy, and I, I I'm addicted. It fits differently. It Once just you start good. buying these shirts and these coats, and they make them for your body. And I'm like, as many events I do, and so much TV and stuff. Like I keep wearing the same folds of honor thing on here because I'm just like, you know, I'm not vain. <laughs> But she came in today and she brought Party Foul a new jacket because I wasn't going to take Party Foul out of town to a big event in Washington, D.C. with him wearing a T-shirt. And Party Foul, you're you're a T-shirt guy. And I'm like, nope, I got to put him in some clothes. (laughs) So she came and dropped off his coat and a couple of shirts. It's a pretty coat. And and what does Brittany do? She shows up with all the new swatches. Absolutely. And she's like, you know, I really like this one. And I'm like, just give me the damn things. And so I'm going through. I'm like, okay, I want these Here's the, these two. So she's making them. Anyway, that's, she needs to give you a discount. I agree. I told her today, I was like, he folks, because of how much money I've spent with Harper and Jones now, which is based out of Dallas, how much money I've spent with him. I said, you need to, like, he, this dude needs a free suit or something. I agree. Thank she you. agreed. Appreciate she that. She agreed. Good. I'm going to hold her to that then. She agreed. I'm going to tell, tell her, her it was recorded it. and she didn't know it. Yeah, you tell her I said it. So anyway, mm-hmm. let's go back. Let's talk about success. Uh, so I, I grew up out in deep east Texas, like a little little town. I graduated from Carlisle High School, 22 students. So I graduated in top 20, <laughs> at least. Um, barely. <laughs> barely. You know, so I tell people, I graduated top 20. I'm super smart. They have no idea. Now I always say, that's a public school. I don't even know where the heck a private school is where I'm from. Right. Um, and, you know, my dad drove a truck, was a preacher. My mom worked in cafeteria and was always trying some little business hustles on the side and um, I barely graduated school, man. School wasn't my thing. I wasn't, I was very, very, um, I had a lot of educational disabilities. I never, and, and, and though I've always been one of those that owns, I own all my faults and everything easily. Yeah. The, the educational disability part was, took me till I was about 25 to actually admit and come out with. I don't yeah. know why it held such a grip on me, but it did. Um, but if it wasn't for those things, it wouldn't have taught me a lot about like, like, um, I didn't want to go, I, which I didn't know back then. Um, I, I, w- I see lots of letters and stuff backwards. I'm dyslexic as it gets. I can't even say the word dyslexic. You can't even say d- dyslexic. Uh, whatever the hell. Dick, my I'm wife always. Dyslexic. My wife always. <laughs> I think all guys are dyslexic. <laughs> all guys should be dyslexic. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me tell you something. If you're not dyslexic, yeah, the, then you're not seeing that backwards. Then. So the funny thing is, 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 is the, the person in me that wanted to be around the crowd, right? Um, I knew that there was a couple people and a friend of mine that actually was real bad at it, and that's how I knew what it was, went to this other class, right? And so I didn't know it was special ed back then. I just knew they were going somewhere else with less people, and I was like, I don't want to be there. So I in never admitted In deep it. East Texas, that's just like normal. Like, yeah. That's just how we're born. Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it was another level. But what's Not funny- Not another level. 
Yeah, it was another, another level. Another level. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta just get through it faster, so you just yeah. knock that yeah. letter off. Um, so the the key in second grade, I won the fastest reader award. It's like, how do you do that? Well, I knew the teacher counted the desk chairs and the paragraphs we would have to read, so I would go home and memorize them the night before yeah. because I didn't want them to know because they would send me to the other class, right? And so a lot of things I look back in my life where. Um, you try to figure out how to teach other people things yeah. and how to get there. And I go, how is I, how am I so resourceful, right? No matter what it is, I'm going to figure my way out of something. I go, and I was thinking at first that might've been something I was born with, but it's not. When I go back, my, the setback that a lot of people would take as a crutch saying they can't make it because of that type of disability. Yeah. yeah. I, that was, I think that's the main reason I'm successful because I figured out a way at a young age to be very resourceful, to figure out a way around any situation. Um, and so I, I look at that as a positive and, and how I honestly believe if it wasn't for that, would I've got creative to figure out I need to maybe memorize this paragraph and stuff, right? And I think that being in success is no matter what the roadblock in front of you, you figure out a way around. That's not a roadblock, right? You get around right? it, yeah. So that wasn't something I was innately born with. It was because of that disability, I wanted a way around it and I figured out ways and that was kind of ingrained. So I think that's where a lot of people... Uh, my wife will say that I, I'm I am uh, a naturally optimistic person, and so yeah. um, I've always tried to figure out a positive way of things. But I, I truly believe that a lot of people use crutches way too much. And so um, I got out of high school, which I barely got out of high school with two of my best friends' names should have been my diploma. I was good at copying their work. <laughs> um, and uh, they should have gotten college credit from just just giving you the answers. That's well, <laughs> I attempted the college thing, the little junior college thing, you know. Yeah. And I had to take the little entrance test thing, and um, um, I made about three semesters in. And I was taking like 12 hours a semester. And um, I go to the counselor person after three of them, and I said, how many hours did I got? She said, like six. I went, what? She goes, well, you're in the third level remedial in math and all of these things. <laughs> and she goes, so so you're, you're one remedial away from being in real college. I go, so, whoa, whoa, whoa. So none of those count. She said, yeah. no. I go, screw this. And I'm I out. left. That day, and said, I ain't go, that thing's not for me. Yeah, you've been working your butt off for remedial classes. And I didn't even know what that was. You were too dumb to know you were in remedial exactly. class. Exactly. <laughs> and I barely passed them. I, barely, I think the teachers just hey, felt sorry for me. I came out of remedial with a C. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it didn't even count. And it didn't even count. That's so funny, dude. So I started selling cars. Um, <laughs> it's like the perfect. I laugh, but it's that's, so true, dude. That's the perfect. This is a success story. Anybody listen to this? I'm telling you, if you want to hear, this is a freaking success story. This is like, like there's, no, it's not possible. There's no one on the planet. This is not an insult to you, Heath. I love you. Yeah. If you can be successful, anybody can be freaking successful. Yeah, but that's it's what true. I. But that's what I love most, though, because what I'd love to do is inspire people who are in that same position to not feel like they got to be held down by whatever it is. Yeah, I'm tired of these damn people using the crutches and stuff. Get off your crutches and go make it happen. You can. I mean, I, I like even when I started selling cars and I made money. You know, the best thing for me was that I was grounded by mother and father of yeah. discipline and the right thing. And in that car business. That even though, look, I went from where um, I'd probably never made 10 grand in a year to my first month selling cars, made 10 grand. Of course, then it was like crack to me. You know, I'm like, OK. Yeah. yeah and it, you um, got addicted to making. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to make money then. And but luckily I was born and raised by mom and dad on the morals and ethics because so, money never overran that for me. So, OK, so that's an important thing. You've said that twice now, and that's an important thing. I jokingly say it's impossible. Like, if you want to be successful, you can be successful. That's that's really not true. You have to have discipline. You, yep. you have got to have that thing in your life that keeps you in the boundaries, or you will get disqualified. Absolutely. In life, and that's that's the thing. And you yep. had that because you had you had, as I say, the vision, vision, passion, discipline, risk, which are my four pillars. You know, you, you saw beyond your boundaries. You were inspired by what you saw. You structured your life around what you saw and you spent your life accomplishing what you saw. So anyway, back to that deal. Yeah. Well, and, and, and that was that was the key, though, is the money didn't wrap me up because I couldn't do things that weren't on the up and up. They, they would push you to do some things that weren't exactly true. And, and, and I'm, I'm a very um, stubborn person. Um, but I'm also stubborn on the things I was raised with. And so I left that, started in the insurance business. I wanted, I mean, again, I wanted 
at that point in my my life, I wanted to make money. That was all that really yeah. was my my goal at that point. I didn't know. <clears throat> I, and heck, I was nineteen years old. So um, nineteen. I, yeah, I started selling insurance. It was thing hundred percent commission, so I could make as much money as I wanted. I didn't want to go to anything that was going to be paying me something, and that was all I was going to get because I wanted to make more than that. Right. And and so uh, most of my friends in the oil field were they were killing it. Right. I mean, they were doing great in it, but I was like, I I don't want to do that. Yeah. Then what I underestimated was it took me four <laughs> times to pass the entrance test. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't pass the damn test. I love so, the story. So I got broke as a joke <laughs> so and lost everything because I couldn't pass the damn entrance test. My first one was like a 50, then like a 60, and then like a 65 and 69, and then finally passed with a 70. Um, and so I did that, and I started selling. Now, think about this. I was 1920, and... I was selling door to door, hundred percent commission, burial life policies, long term care, Medicare supplements. Knocking on Absolutely. doors. I've been kicked out of almost every neighborhood in East Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And most people won't do that. No, absolutely not. Most people didn't want to make as much money as I wanted to make. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to yeah. now and I and I keep saying that because that changed. Money is something I still like, but I don't want to try to act like um, that wasn't my driving factor because it was at a young age. Yeah. Um, and I since have learned a lot more, right? Um, as you do, hopefully as you get older, some don't, but, um, I started doing that and, and made just more money than I just absolutely, I mean, insurance was something that was everything you read about building wealth was, was residual income, right? Building mailbox money, doing something and whatnot. Yeah. So insurance was that insurance was, uh, something that you get paid on when you sell as long as you take care of your, your clients and stuff. Right. So, I started doing that. Then I built my own insurance agency up to a couple million dollars, sold it, built another agency. And then the company that I went to work for um, because of my other agency w- was out was I was 23 years old. I was the youngest executive in the company. And I took over North Florida, South Georgia. A couple years later, came back to Texas. So now I'm over Texas, Oklahoma, East Texas, West Texas, uh, Louisiana. Um, I've got, um, you know, 800 to 1,000 about salespeople in my organization, about 50, 60 offices. Um, Collected. Are you even 32 yeah. yet? 31. You're 31. That's what I thought. That pisses yeah. me off. Yeah. No, I, I love that. I love that. And that's why, he folks, you have always been the go-to guy that whenever I'm talking to people, and I'm, and I'm talking to people all the time, and I'm talking about success stories and inspiration stories and motivational stories, I'm like, you, you need to know my guy, Heath Oaks. I said, this guy, ah, yeah, it's, but you, it, it's a whole other level. But let me just say, so so you wrote a book, and I want you to finish that thought because we're going to talk about the book more later. You wrote a book called Ignorance on Fire, Failing Your Way to Success, yep. which is a great book. It's a it's an easy book to read. Yep. Uh, it's a quick book to read. It is loaded with tips on how to – because, again, I don't believe in excuses. Yeah, I don't either. I just don't believe in excuses. Uh, my good friend um, – uh, uh, Amberly Snyder. Amberly Snyder, who is a, a nationally ranked champion barrel racer, is paralyzed from the waist down because of she's 29 years old. She's 28 years old. She had a um, horrific car accident nine years ago, almost killed her, uh, put her in a wheelchair. She's, she's paralyzed from the waist down. She is, and I saw her a couple of weeks ago. She's just a beautiful human being. There, uh, Netflix actually has a movie coming out in the next month about her story, but she's she still gets on a horse even though she's paralyzed from the waist down. She still gets on a horse and she competes on a professional level as a barrel racer. And she just had this thing. I just saw this deal where uh, United uh, Air just had a United Airlines just the guy at the gate wouldn't let her get on the plane. She travels alone. Yeah, like she's very independent in this wheelchair. And the guy wouldn't let her get on the gate. He wanted to transfer her to a airline deal. And and, and, and anyway, it became this big debacle and, and all these things. So anyway, I bring up Amberly because I'm like, there's no excuses. You're, there's no excuses. You don't have to do this stuff. I mean, you, everybody these days are either trying to find out ways that they're victims or finding out ways that they can come up and excuse their deal. People don't want their problems fixed. They want their problems understood. That, that wears me out. And you're I, 31 years old. But but the, it 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 sounds corny to people. But the truth is it all is a mindset change. Yeah. It's if that bad thing that happens you see it as bad or you see it as good makes the difference. And I know a lot of people are going, 
Oh, sure, that's what everybody says. But it truly is. I mean, you make a decision. You own your brain. Your brain doesn't own you. You can make that decision of a switch. And it is really has a lot to do with that, that, that being that simple that takes time to work on it. Yeah. Um, it's not a, a, a get-rich-quick scheme. It's not even that. I had many of failures that didn't work because that was a quick snippet, you know. Um, but the thing is, is I, I made choices over time to continue to work on myself and be better and surround myself with better people. And, you know, you keep on talking about me, but I, I'll tell you one of my keys with you, uh, and, and it always has been, is that um, that you're an honest person and do what you say you're going to do. Like when we started the podcast, what was interesting to me, this was very eye-opening about you to me. You had a lot more to bring to the table on that podcast. I mean, I'm talking, I mean, a lot more, right? I, I didn't, I don't have people to follow me, none of that stuff like you, right? You had a tremendous amount more. And you were like, let's do this podcast. And I was like, hey, you know, I, I was like, you know, what if it, you know, we weren't making any money, didn't intend on it, whatever, right? But like, you were like, look, we'll just, you know, if, if we ever make any money one day, we'll split it down the middle, no big deal. There was nothing in writing, there was nothing at all. But I was like, I can I said, I'm going to at least pay for it, and you don't pay for it because it, I don't I believe. I was totally okay with that. I know, I but would, I, I, I was like, you, I don't believe I should be getting 50% like, like, no, of it I, when no, you I, literally will be bringing most. But like, no. you I, doing I was a totally hand, willing to let you pay the bills on the production costs. <laughs> <laughs> you, you doing the handshake deal that some, to something that you brought that much more to the table on, Knowing it would kind of work out was something that made me all I needed to know because um, typically people who trust others are trustworthy people, and you have proven to be every drop of that. Well, I, I believe in I believe in my friends, and 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 I don't take you know. There's we there's, didn't know each other that long at that point. We didn't, but I but again, it was instant. Mm-hmm. So you know, there's friendship, there's acquaintances, and I'm telling you, once it becomes a friendship, it's it's a solidified deal. But let me t- let me tell you about the success of Second Shot. I don't know Heath how much research on this you've done when it comes to podcasts. I've done a lot because I think that I got a burp. Podcasts yeah. are the I, when you talk a lot and you drink apple juice, you burp. Yeah. So um, that apple juice gets you. Apple juice will get you, man. It's so healthy. Uh, it keeps the flu away. That's what <laughs> it does. Okay, so there are about six hundred thousand podcasts that are national or internationally distributed. Yep. In the world today. I'm talking about legitimate podcasts, about 600,000. The average podcast gets 30 downloads a month. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Hard to believe. Yeah. It's hard to believe. Yeah. People, they everybody's got a podcast. Everybody's got a podcast. They put the thing out there. If it gets 30 downloads in a month, no matter how many you put out, and then people are like, oh, well, hey, I'm in, I'm in the 95th percentile. We were getting 1,000 a week. Yeah. Which was not like the way it wasn't viral numbers. I used to think, well, dude, we should be getting a whole lot more than that. Let me tell you, that became huge because as I studied that and I'm like, you know, the the, the success of Second Shot, we were, we were getting good numbers on that deal as podcasts go. Yeah. And so I think podcasts are the wave of the future. I think that I love the fact that because one of the hardest things that I ever had to do was to come to you and say, look, I got an opportunity. I got to take it. But I, it wasn't that hard because you're a business guy. Well, I, what did I tell you right yeah, away? Yeah. I said, dude, you know. this is what you do to make a living, not me. I don't blame you at all. So we went, you know, we we made the transition over. We created the Chad Brady Show. And, of course, now we're on Blaze TV and we're doing these things. And and uh, we had, you know, we had, it's been it's been a successful thing. It's been a lot My of fun. My wife's a lot better to look at doing it, too. Well, your wife, <laughs> Heath, you're a pretty man. I don't know if you figured this out or not. Look at these socks. I wish we could zoom. I like that's one of the things we got to do, Mark. When we get in the new studio, we got you got to be able to zoom. We got to be able to get really a tight I guess shot. I had bought my wife enough red bottom shoes that she decided to buy me some. So I'm a fan of uh, uh, Labotans. I think this is the sexiest shoe on a woman ever. And then you're wearing, but that's, yeah, you've been that's wearing a good these. It's a good looking shoe. Yeah, I like it. See, people don't think yeah. I have any class. You know, I just show up <laughs> like a redneck and stuff like that. But I'm like, look at you. You're pimping with it. So I'm always using you as a, as the tail. Like, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm telling the tail. I'm just like, you know what? You want to talk about success. You need to meet my friend Heath Oaks because ever since the age of 19, he hasn't made under X amount of dollars. And and I'll make up all kind of astronomical yeah, yeah, yeah. things, <laughs> stuff like that. And then I'm like, and you need to read his book. Yeah. You need to read uh, Ignorance on Fire, which is a great title. Which Ig- a lot of publishers wouldn't do it because they said I had changed the title. Because they said it was negative. 
Yeah. And I went, I even understand that's not negative. Failing your way to success. Yeah. So you wear, we talked about Harper and Jones, you wear the best suits. I mean, like I you, love them. You, you're all about the designs, you're all about the mm-hmm. style and all these things. I want to go back into your uncle. I want you to tell me what motivated you on that and well, why. Why is that important? Well, you know what was interesting? It was writing the book that it that I realized where it came from because mm-hmm. I never really thought about it because my dad is, it, he, they, they got a church in Troop, Texas, Gospel Barn, and <laughs> my dad is the quintessential redneck. Yeah. Okay. Well, he pastors a place called the Gospel Barn. Absolutely. So, so I'm thinking, uh, <laughs> so Bougie, definitely, Sean, Bougie Sean, if you're, would you go to a church called the Gospel Barn? Bougie Sean doesn't go to church. I know. <laughs> I know. Bougie Sean is our resident agnostic who sits over here and probably voted for Obama. But you know what? First time I did. <laughs> Second time I didn't vote. And then you, then you didn't vote. I just stopped voting. Do, I voted once in my lifetime. You couldn't do Mitt Romney. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so the gospel barn. Go back to your dad. But I, so I definitely, that wasn't where my, my and, and again, it's um, where I come from. You don't know, you never, never saw people. I mean, the rich people had you know, um, beautiful starch jeans and expensive boots and yeah, all they that. And, and they were cleaning. real rich people, okay? Yeah. Um, but that's what their rich was. So my uncle... <laughs> when, I don't even... Steve, no, tell never me mind. I just don't, even wanna, <laughs> don't even want to go there. I was going to say, that is. That's why I take my jeans to the dry cleaners. That makes me feel... I know. You know successful. Successful. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> we only grew up about 30 miles from each other. Where'd you grow up? Corgan. Oh, did you? Yep. Corgan Camden? Yep. Right? That's it. Oh, my God. My, I would Y'all say you bigger. might be my son, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about but, things you know, coming full your circle. Mom's name? <laughs> yeah. So we <laughs> took, hang on, hold that thought, yeah. Heath, and I'm going to tell you a funny story. So we were on the bus, and we went from, we went and did a show in Shreveport, Bougie Sean, and Metro Jason were on the deal. Like, Jason is, it's safe to travel with Jason because he's pretty and he passes as a white dude, even though he's Hispanic. <laughs> and, and, like, you got to be careful traveling around America, man. It's full of hate, man. There's these MAGA, MAGA hat wearing people that'll beat you half to death. I mean, they're hate filled KKK members. And we had party foul. And we were in, what town did we go through on Jasper, the way to Jasper? We went to Jasper, Texas, where South, where deep East Texas. Actual hate crimes have happened. Yep. And we stopped and we made Bougie Sean go into the Walmart with us. And we went shopping, and we bought all the kombucha, and we bought the we bought the most bougie foods. You guys were on keto. Bus. It wasn't just me eating the bougie food. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted my kombucha. <laughs> I know. I was hoping that I like I wanted to do a recreation of the you know. <laughs> I wanted to take bougie Sean into Jasper, Texas. You just need to film. The I was other a little people. uncomfortable getting off the bus, oh, man. You know, it was that's little, funny. It was interesting going in there. <laughs> anyway, let's go back. Let's back to what matters. Uh, let's talk about it. So uh, it was my uncle, right? So yeah, yeah, my uncle was a single guy his whole life, basically, and was in the car business, running massive dealerships and everything all over the all, all over the uh, all over the country. So um, he would he always when he would show up once a year in a Viper with some new um, hot like blonde or or um, um, somebody right in Viper Corvette or anything like that. So. And he was always in something crazy. So he had purple velvet suits. He had NASCAR suits. You name it. He wore nuts. And he was six foot four. So he always had the crazy stuff. And so that was where my um, look of something loud. You wanted to look successful. My uncle was the only the the most successful person I'd ever seen or known. Right. I mean, he yeah. had all the cool stuff and all those things, and he had the fancy shoes. I mean, he had all that stuff. So I. Um, everybody will say that that knew my uncle was, you know, I I am a lot like my uncle was, and 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 definitely that's right. where I got my dress. Right, but it stands out because people don't forget you. Well, for me, it actually just started really is wearing suits because I was nineteen twenty and I literally looked ten years old. <laughs> so <laughs> putting a you, suit, you got the baby face. You so, got, well, I mean, you are a baby. Yeah. But you got the baby face. Putting the suit and tie on, I actually looked more like eighteen versus ten. So one of the things that I appreciate about you, Heath, is that you dress the part of a professional. Yep. You go out and yeah, you're a hustler. Yeah, you're a salesperson. But you put on a suit. You put on a tie every day. People don't do that anymore. Yeah. I, I, I look. I 
here's my thing is in the world I'm in, I have a lot of offices and, and they all are, are recruiting people to 100 percent commission world. Right. To build their own book of insurance business for themselves. Right. To hold their destiny in their hand. If somebody sits at a table and is talking to somebody and says, hey, you come follow me. I'll teach you the system. I'll teach you how to wake up in the morning and do these things and you'll be successful and it'll be worth the risk. Right. Because it's a risk to go do that. Right. So it better be worth the reward. If I look broke, who wants to come follow me to be broke? Right. Nobody. Nobody wants to go take the risk to be broke. Somebody wants to take the risk to go, okay, that's that's I want that. And so, so we were at we were at a baseball game. We were at the Texas Rangers. I was in the suite yep. that you had for your for your group of salespeople. We were you invited Jade and I, we came over there, we were in y'all suite, and I can't tell you there were these people and I said, How did you get connected with Heath? And they said, well, we knew him forever. I mean, like we knew him in East Texas. We knew this guy. And so I had this one guy. He said, um, this is such a telling story. He said, I was sitting there and um, my wife looked at me across the dinner table and said, if I hear one more story of you getting an offer from Heath Oaks to go to work for him, and then I hear about one more person that started making a million dollars a year and you didn't take that opportunity, I'm leaving you. <laughs> yeah. He was like, if I, if, if you watch Heath Oaks make one more MF for rich yeah. and it's not you, you're going to regret it. Exactly. And he moved. Yeah, yeah he moved. Shreveport, right? He yeah. moved to Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He didn't want to move to Louisiana. Yeah. And he was one of the guys Nobody that Nobody wants to move to Louisiana. <laughs> no lie. But he was one of the guys that should, uh-huh. his name should have been on my high school diploma because yeah. I copied off of him and everything. He was oh, a smart guy. So he was a smart that. one, yeah. Because he was telling me all about, he's like, look, I was doing this, I was doing this, I was doing this. I mean, I had this education. I was smart, dude. I mean, I had, and he goes, my wife looked at me and said, if, if you hear, if you, if I hear that Heath L. Oaks made one more person rich. Yeah. And it's not you. And it's not you. You're going to regret it. Yeah. And that's the deal. And that's, you know, that's, that's what I would, I would hope. And especially in our industry and stuff, because it's filled with a bunch of bad people too, right? I mean, business in general, there's a lot of. Um, um, bad things that go on with a lot of people that are greedy that that take advantage of it, and um, we and I, I was meeting with a buddy of mine, Scott, that was One Life America, and him and Scotty, who who really run that organization across Southeast, they're really good people, yeah, and they do right by their people. So we were talking about it. And it's like how much easier it makes it when you actually just do right by people you bring in because you're so different than others because of all the bad people make it when you really do right that good things happen and come from it do you think that you could make party foul steve successful like do you think no sean says no bougie sean says no he like like, i've got a suit (laughs) (laughs) you have a half of a suit i have a half a suit you even have a full suit (laughs) you got a coat (laughs) gotta use that suit (laughs) he's made it that's it. He's got a coat. Hey, no, he's he hey, not doing too shabby. Hey, he's <laughs> he's smarter than me because he got his pay for. I know. Well, that's a fact. I bought it for him. Yeah. So it's, I know. Well, I just said I man, drive I the nicest vehicles. You uh, do absolutely. Wow. He drives. You know, like we just added. Here's what's funny. Here's what's funny. I have to add party foul Steve on my insurance because he drives all my vehicles <laughs> so much. <laughs> I told you you need, buy, you need to buy the mobile office and drive it. So let's talk about the mobile office. Yeah. So so Heath, uh, a couple years ago, he told me this this phenomenon that I didn't know existed. Sean, I'm going to tell you about this. I don't think I've told you this story. This is fascinating. So Heath, uh, I, talk about time. Talk about it. Because because that's it's the one commodity you don't get back. You don't. Well, and that was my thing is, is a lot of people would look at it and think it's um, a uh, – Kind of a vein thing, right? Is that a word? Is vein? Is that did I yeah, use that it's right? Vein, yeah. So I did good there, didn't I? You did good. Yeah, good. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> I love that you doubted yourself. <laughs> I of course, you perfectly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> my man sitting here in a three thousand dollars suit talking about his vein a word. Yeah. <laughs> Chad, you act like that's like uncommon for me to make something up. Come on now. That's a tragedy. Hey, until I met until I met Chad. That's a tragedy. Until I met Chad, I thought Waller was how you said Waller. I did not know it meant it you was Waller. You just said the same damn word twice. I thought Waller is <laughs> how you say know. Waller. It means Wallow. Wallow. See, okay. I didn't, until I met you, I didn't know. 
<laughs> First of all, normal people don't even use the word wallow. That's like I Jesse have... Smollett talking about we tussled. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> says tussle. <laughs> we tussle. Jesse, it's pretty close. Listen, Jesse, you got the Wakandan beatdown that you paid for, brother. It wasn't a tussle. They kicked your ass. It was a tussle. We just we tussled a little bit. That's what gay dudes do. Gay dudes tussle. That's sex. That's not fighting. Okay? Oh, Mark knows know. what I'm talking about. I don't even know where we were at now. Oh, yeah. We're talking about... Uh, we're talking about um, um, Dad, come on. What were we talking time. about? Okay, so time. Okay, so time. Yes. Yeah. So here's the thing. I never thought much about time because I got married, you know, later in life as well. And then um, when I got married and then, then we had our daughter on the ways, when I thought about it and I said, okay, because I tra- I got a big area I cover, right? And and so I was having to drive out, you know, a couple hours away, a couple hours meetings, coming back. Then I have to come in and have to work all night to get caught up on it, right? And so... Um, I bought a mobile office, and and you go like a Becker Auto Design, look it up, and you can find you can find uh, you yeah, you you can find uh, some of the offices. So it's a it's a um, it's not just and Chad figured this out too. It, it's pretty uh, different than just a regular old um, like a you put a laptop in the back. It's it's like a private jet in the back of a, a of a excursion that's completely done up. Hired driver, my neighbor, and Rick would drive me <laughs> from then on to all of these meetings because my neighbor, you know, what was important to me was not only um, getting it done, but like why it mattered to me then was I want uh, my daughter is going to know her dad. My daughter is not going to be one of those. Like you don't have to give success up and money for being a family person. Right. You just got to get creative. And so I figured I had you know three six hours of dead time when I was driving versus now. When I got home, I could shut it off and be with my family if I bought this mobile office and stuff. And uh, then Chad had a show, and he's like, "Can I use it?" So I had Rick. Rick drove you drove you down, and a lot of people think, but as you know, when you get in there, I mean, it's like a private jet inside. Sure, it's like a it's like a limousine, but it's more like limousines. People think about limousines. Limousines aren't comfortable. Yeah, well, and they're showy. It's like big. Like this from the yeah. outside is just. Looks like an excursion from the yeah, outside. Yeah, it looks like an excursion. They yeah. extend the roof by like six inches. They put a satellite on mm-hmm. the top of it so that you can get a news feed or whatever, or a satellite Internet feed and, everything. and watch your deal. You can get, and you're you're like, you got a phone. You can call up front and talk to them. You, you can dial out. Yep. You got a Wi-Fi that I never could figure out. They got a, uh, they got, like I was able to watch Fox News. Yes, yes. Fox News. The whole <laughs> four hours down, four hours back. So I had to go speak at this deal in, I don't know, around San Antonio. Yeah. He drove me down because, and the reason I used it is because I knew that I had to fly out at 6 a.m. the next morning, and I knew for me to go down there and come back, I wouldn't get in until about 3 a.m. So I, I literally got home, and I was saying, well, I can sleep because I can lay these seats back because it's like a private jet. It is, yeah. Meet, so you, you, this, this thing is like, it's tricked out in the back. Oh, yeah. And, Soundproof and everything. But I was so, I was worried. Like, get this, Mark. Now, you would think, like, I could just lay back and sleep, right? Didn't sleep a wink. I was up all night. You know why? Because I'm like, I think he's going to be tired, and he might cross over the center line or something like that or drive. And so, like, I was watching. Rick is the man. When you roll the when you roll the screen up, which separates you and your driver, there's a flat screen TV, and so there's Fox News, and I'm watching the news, and there was something specific. I can't remember now what was going on in the news then but it was something that i didn't want to pull away from but i kept i kept the the shade like that much crack just so i could make sure rick stayed awake <laughs> and so you wouldn't be like, a control freak would you i'd, I'd be sitting here like 3 a.m and i'd be like hey rick you still good man you okay <laughs> steve steve he's not a control freak is he he keeps a good eye on me most <laughs> yeah. of the time we've yeah. done a few late night drives i don't so, have to drive very often but when i do it's steve easy. drives a lot and Steve has driven through the night, and let me tell you, I've had to come to a point where I want to tell Steve, don't do this, don't do that. And I'm like, you know what? He, It's his job to drive. So that's part of his job to drive. And I'm like, I'm not going to tell him which lane to be in or, or where. <laughs> you know, know. I, I, I prefer this lane. I'm like, <laughs> you're not driving. <laughs> well, I mean, when you're that you close, when you're that close to that cement wall Cement in the walls middle, don't move. I know. And what <laughs> I'm afraid is you're going to run into one. I'm so. not going to if, I, I just keep my face in the phone. I try to ignore the whole thing. <laughs> you did the whole time you drove to Beaumont. Oh. <laughs> that was a long haul in the oh, U-Haul. Brutal. Yeah. <laughs> we did that. So let's talk about that. And, and yeah, I do love the mobile office. You trying to sell that thing? Yeah, I'm going to sell it. You're going to sell it? 
Yeah, because now I need to do more flying because everything I got. Yeah, you're more regionalized you're all over now. The place. Yeah, so yeah. if anybody wants to buy a mobile office, yeah, uh, I got one for you. Heath Oaks will make a deal. I bet if you go to his Twitter, put it up there, uh, bo- uh, Director Mark. I almost called you Bougie Mark. You can go you're to Twitter, so not hit bougie. it up, and I'll yeah. get it for you. Go to Heath Oaks, shoot him a message, and buy because that that is a cool deal. What oh, they yeah. do that that uh, deal in California, they trick those things out. Oh yeah, it's, it's pretty cool and super comfortable. So if you want to buy a if you want to buy a mobile office and then find somebody to drive you. Who knows? You can hire Rick. Absolutely. Well, 15, there's tons of people 16, nowadays. Yeah. Uber and everything. Yeah. You can find a They'll lot of people, you, little drivers. Like $15 an hour, you pay them and then tip them at the end of the deal and yeah. the whole thing. And, and you just get back to ride back and actually do work. Yeah, you can't get, waste yeah. time. You can't get your time back. Mm-hmm. So you and I got it on our heart after Hurricane Harvey, and we said, you know, Houston's getting all this attention. What about the small towns? Small towns, like uh, Mauriceville and Orange and, you know, Beaumont and all these places down there, and because all the news media, and that was weird and all the because, stuff was being given to Houston. Yeah, and Fox News, they had me on to talk about that. In fact, the day we took our drive down to Mauriceville in that U-Haul, uh, we put it on the podcast, we put it on social media, and we said, "Hey, we're going to be at uh, XYZ School um, loading up," and people just showed up and started bringing us supplies. And it was funny because I was on Fox News, and you know Fox always wants me to come on and kind of be funny, and I'm like, I can't be funny about Hurricane Harvey. Yes. Nothing. So I was like, okay, look, here's what we need. We need bug spray because we got mosquitoes the size of birds in Texas. In fact, I saw a, a mosquito that was standing flat-footed humping a turkey, and we need, <laughs> we need bug spray. So to this day, I still have bug spray in my garage that people just after the fact just kept sending it, kept sending it. So if you need bug spray, I got it at the house. Dude, do you remember the front of that U-Haul? It was solid black, black from with, Love Bugs. Oh man, it was Love tough. Bugs. I, you know what? You know what? We they made that trip Bugs? fast. Let's be honest. We got you down drove. There. I did. So you rented the we rented the U-Haul. We loaded that thing up. We went down and we went to what was it the First Baptist Church in Maurice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who had been flooded out, and and it was it was sad because you're on your way down there and you're seeing the worst of the worst. We really didn't go into the horrible places. People are lined up trying to get fed. They're trying to get yeah. food. The church had been flooded out, so they're trying to salvage what they could, and they had a great little station set up. But those love bugs, Mark, you know why they call them love bugs? Yeah, because they're stuck together. <laughs> they're <laughs> constantly making love, dude. I mean, like, yeah. They got the laugh. Yeah, and then until they hit the front of that U-Haul. Yeah. And we were, the whole front of that truck Black, was just, uh. solid. That was fun, though. We got down there, I mean, I that baby was pegged out. I had it hitting that limit a lot. <laughs> yeah, that thing was, that thing was, um. Yeah, yeah, we were rocking Because we had to get back so my wife could go to bed for work cause, so I could watch our daughter. Remember, she had to get up at 2.30 the next morning for work. So we had to, like, yeah, get we back. Yeah, because that's back when Jenny was still doing the yeah, morning shows. Yeah. And she's, I don't know how the morning show thing works. I mean, you're yeah. getting up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. No, nah, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, we were hustling. But we were armed to the teeth. We had guns. We weren't taking any chances. No. Nah. Like we were, because people get crazy in the middle of a, mm-hmm. an emergency. It was fun. But if you, if you had, you know, I, I have these people... And I'm like, look, you got your whole life in front of you. You only got one of them. And you have this opportunity to go out there and make the most of it. Uh, we just walked past Glenn Beck's new um, Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see, Bougie, did you see on the back, it's got, it says YOLO? No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. <laughs> pinstriping. In the pinstriping. Is that his? Is that- it's his. <laughs> it's a beautiful car. If you, you know, if you go, the thing about Bentleys is like they don't give you a model number. No. You're either driving a Bentley or you're not driving a Bentley. Yeah. So the white Bentley that's parked out here, um, it, the pinstriping down the deal at the very back on the trunk, just below the pinstriping, it's YOLO. That's funny. <laughs> it's kind of funny, isn't that it? That is funny. But you do only live once. And the older you get, the more you realize that. You, I appreciate because you took advantage of what could be done at a very young age you're still at a very young age but i don't think of you like that because it sounds condescending i mean you're you're a you're a brother 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 to me and so i uh you and i've walked a lot of miles in the last few years but what do you say to people i mean how do you how do you you the people that want to find the excuses that want to be victims that all these things and look let's face it that's human nature not everybody can be a success if they were, then there would be no such thing as success. Number one, what I tell people is don't let others define success for you. Don't don't look at me and think I am success. I am what I I am striving for what I believe success is. So 
you know, there's nothing wrong with if what you want doesn't look like success to others. My, my, I've, I've had somebody ask me, they said, well, what if, um, I'm somebody who doesn't want to try to go make a ton of money and stuff. I want to like do my job that I like and then like uh, ride bicycles afterwards and stuff all the time, right? I go, then you're being successful. The problem is, is you can't bitch about not having the other things and then act like you're happy with what you have, right? So that's right. what happens to people. So if that's okay with you, then you're successful in my eyes because you are def- you are reaching the potential you feel like you are and you're spending the time where you want it to be spent. The problem with most of those people are is that they then are negative about their situation um, and that doesn't help. So so if you're in that spot that that's what are, all, all the type of work and risk you, you're willing to do, <clears throat> that's fine. Be okay with it. Own it. But don't be negative about it. Be positive about yeah. it. Be like you're you're in the spot you want to be because it's not made for everybody. So that's my biggest thing. Is you got to define what success is to you. I, I, you can't look to people and say that is the only thing. It's not because I know a lot of monetary rich people that are miserable, worthless human beings. Um, and it's I know true. a lot of worthless human beings that that uh, is for that don't make any money that are extremely happy because. They're doing their passion. So that's success. So success is what you define it to be. Don't let others do it. Money in and of itself is not going to make you happy. No. It's not going to make you happy. No. Um, It'll make my wife happy. (laughs) Yeah. I'm kidding. Your money will make her happy. Yeah. Now, look, I've always um, said, I was. Sean's um, wife's a great kisser, by the way. Let everybody know this. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I've been rich and broken. It has been easier being having money it is it is um you know and and thank god for capitalism the uh, system of economics that raises and brings more people out of poverty than any system of economics that's ever existed in history so you know i i am not a fan of this whole idea of socialism and all that marxism that so many are advocating these days it's crazy deal but that's the thing but like but but money and material things don't define me I can we give can't. all of that. I can give it all up tomorrow. I will, and my wife knows that I'm the type that would risk it all on something that I think will be the next good thing. Oh, I believe, and that. there's a good chance we lose it all and start all over. But you, she's okay because she knows I'll go work. She, I'm, I'm a somebody will always let me sell something, and I only make money if I sell it, yeah. which means it's in my hands to do so. I, I know not everybody's wired that way. Yeah, I say uh, over and over: if you can, if you can sell, you'll always be okay. Absolutely. That's why. That's why. Even when we've gone through our down times financially and our hard times and things like that, I'm like, mm, I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to go out there and find another way to hustle. Absolutely. And you know, we've done that. And uh, you know, my my wife, she's you know, Jade's always she's looked at me and she's like, I'm not worried. You know, whatever we go through, I'm, not, I'm just not worried about it. And uh, she's a worrier, and I had to teach her early on. Like, nah, don't worry. My wife's a warrior, too. Money's just a thing. Yeah. Money's just a thing. And that's why you know the Bible says it's, the Bible does not say that. L- that money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. But th- th- that's what. That's why it's so imperative that it can't. It, it can't control you. It life. can't control you. Yeah. Like yeah. I'm not. I'm not defined by it to the point that I'm not scared to lose it. Yeah. Or give it away or do whatever. I'm not. I don't. I like it. I like the challenge. I almost like the challenge and the competition and the journey of it all um, more than I, than really. The other part, because the success is not an end game. If you keep looking to an end game, you're going to be dissatisfied every time you get to that that little end process. Yeah, you've got to enjoy that journey process and that making it all. And, well, because and you through get it. there and you go, what what did I just do? I mean, okay, I busted my ass and now I have all this money or success or whatever or fame, and am I happy? No. Well, maybe if I get a little bit more. That's a bad treadmill to get on. It, it's a bad little. It's a bad to run. It and is. I knew that for me that having a wife that I loved and having a family was going to be important to me. But I knew that if I it, so I spent all of my time, you know, the first eight, nine years so grinding for business and not really looking much out of that because I wanted to get all that straight. And then I met the love of my life who actually does complex like my wife and I are 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 a tandem that help each other in a lot of ways. She inspires me. I try to inspire her. I'm going to be better and do more because of and then we had our daughter come along and of course she owns me like nobody's business. Mm-hmm. And and those are the things that I love being able to provide the things I am with time um, with all of them. But um, what I hate in this world nowadays is the fact that people point to 
um, success is just these money type of achievements versus um, success is what you define success to be. And and I think I think that's what you've got to get to a point of is the understanding live up to your full potential, whatever that yeah. may be. Maybe that's being the best stay at home mom that possibly can be. Then you're successful. You got to find your happiness inside that. If it's um, r- yours is passion of of uh, of uh, d- racing anything and you just want to work to pay for that habit and that's your happiness, then that's great. Don't let nobody tell you any different. And that's that's what I get sick of in this world is the, the fact that people want to point to certain uh, money or, or, or monetary things that says that's what success is. And, yeah. and I don't believe that. It's not. No. Own it, baby. Own it. Mark, you're a success. Bougie Sean, you're a success. Party fouls a success. They haven't been they haven't been near as talkative in ours versus um the one I heard with, with Jenny. Yeah. We're learning. <laughs> we're, we're taking it all in. Trust me, I'm trying to make these these guys successful. <laughs> it's hard to be successful in my category. No, you do you do good. I'm trying. You're the best at what you do. I told Sean, I texted him yesterday, he and Jason, and I said, well, at least you guys have um, job security because I won't work with anybody else. On our Humor Me show on Blaze TV, I'm like, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm only working with these guys. If, they fire, if you fire them, you got to fire me. I'm out. I'm hopefully, out. Hopefully they don't fire me. What's going on? <laughs> no, no, no. Something fire they need to know about? They won't because you know you're a success. That's yeah. the beauty of it. So you just got to own that stuff. All right. <laughs> I love you, buddy. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you're, you're I appreciate welcome. it. Tell me you love me back. Tell me I you love you. Yeah, thank you. Aww. Oh, Heath Oaks. What's, <laughs> the, what's the website where people can get your book? Uh, Amazon. Just go on Amazon yeah, go on and Amazon. do Ignorance on Fire, Heath yep. Oaks. Yep. It's a good one. I, in a, I think anybody can read it. Like I, It's a story Anyone format. can read it. It's, it's a, great, a story yeah. format to be fun for anybody, but I really, the hope behind it was that... Um, it could be a staple of people graduating high school and graduating college into the world of 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 something to help set them on on because it tells the journey of the young person that started off with that money was everything, you know, um, but then found that balance that I'm not going to lie and act like I don't like money. I do. I like having nice things, okay? Uh, I'm not going to apologize for that either. But I'm going to tell you, I learned that that wasn't the end-all, be-all. And so it tells the story of a young person of things that – not letting bad people wrap me up because of money that I, I stuck to my ethics and what I was raised with. And so I think, and I hope it is an inspiring story for anybody starting off in any kind of new venture or anything, especially out of high school and college and stuff that um, a parent or grandparent, um, the best compliment I could ever get would be a grandparent or, or mother or something, giving it to a grandson or, or, or son graduating for them to read, to set into life, to know that, um, no matter what you see out in there, you can do things the right way and make it and have all of the things of success, not just money, not just, you know, so you can have your family and you can be involved in all those things and do it all. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Yeah. So I used to tell Jade all the time, I was like, you know, Heath and I just got done doing the Second Shot podcast and we're going to go down here and we're going to sit at this uh, hotel bar because the the, the office, the, the studio yeah. was connected to the hotel over there in Dallas. Yeah. And we're going to have a drink. And I said, when I spend my time with Heath Oaks, I come away inspired and wanting to work harder. So there's always people who say, man, how do you have the energy to go do what you do? Yeah. You know, you're always on an airplane, always in an airport, always doing these things. And and I'm like, well, tell you what, after I sit down for 30 minutes with Heath Oaks, just over a cocktail, I promise you, I ain't doing enough. I'm ready to go. So I appreciate the inspiration that you bring to people. Well, that goes both ways. Yeah. Well, Trust me. I, I'm, yeah. Well, Trust me. Yeah. I'll, I, we'll I saw what you've done in a very short amount of time. Yeah. Very it's, impressive. It's been fun to do. Been fun to do. And uh, I'm thankful for the people in my life, and I'm thankful for everybody sitting in the studio here today. Heath Oaks, go get his book. It's called Ignorance on Fire, Failing Your Way to Success. You need to follow him on Twitter at Heath Oaks, and I think your Instagram is Ignorance on Fire? Yeah, in, it, it, Instagram is Ignorance on Fire. Ignorance on Fire is the Instagram, so go do that. And more than anything, subscribe and listen weekly to the podcast, Second Shot, with Heath Oaks, Jenny Ann Chondo. I love you, buddy. Your family. Thanks for coming on. Love you guys. I love you guys, too. I want you to go and not just watch this and listen to it. I want you to go subscribe. Go to where podcasts are offered. I want you to subscribe. 
download it and make sure that you are one of, because I promise you, there are some things. We're going to make a couple of changes. Not only are we going to be changing studios around and, and you're going to watch that process. It's going to be a fun story to tell. But we also have a few things that you're not going to want to miss. We got some stuff we're gonna we're gonna surprise you with here in the next couple of weeks. So make sure that you're paying attention, you're staying in tune. Look, we got we got four a week now. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's impressive. And we're doing the Humor Me show. So I encourage people to go to blazetv.com slash Chad. You can use promo code Chad and you'll save a little bit of money. And I encourage you to get that annual download. Look, it's the same price as a big dinner for you and your your wife or husband or whatever it is that you do so i just <laughs> so go out there and get your subscription and and you need to get the full episodes of humor me and uh keep listening in. all right we're getting out of here what are you drinking a little water what <laughs> me too anyway i love y'all god bless you we'll see you tomorrow bye